So then, we are back with more understandings of the time of the second tabernacle services where we find in the Aramaic English translation of the word. This translation comes from the original manuscripts of the prophets of the Tzayelic lineage. So then, we can understand the time of the end as Pergirashiahu the prophet. We find layers of understanding of the spring feast, the autumn feast and also the returning of the cities of the Messiah laid the waste for many centuries. As then we take the time and read Yerushiahu the prophet, we then find these layers, sometimes not very personal. And the problem is, is because people are so far away from the Creator Himself, because they have considered themselves being the temple of his very spirit. The more they think this way, the far away they get from him. So let's then evaluate the reasons why we should then humble ourselves and do what then Shaliach Shaul said as far as, as the instructions. Obviously, his words should never be replaced with the words of the Messiah. That's not the point. But then, when a person is then born again, when a person finds the path, then learning the instructions, it's very obvious. But some people, when they read the instructions, they think of themselves as reading drudgery or then some sort of relation with loss that they can't put up with it. The only trouble is when they can't put up with it, that's where then they find evil in themselves. So then, we were born in a world extremely contaminated. Let's then evaluate Yohanan, then the third chapter. Because the Creator so loved the world that He gave His only Son, to whomever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. To those people who discard the holy instructions, those precise understandings of Moses, how can they claim such situation? Let's then evaluate what the Creator Himself did. Firstly then, as far as, as His Son, every time the Messiah spoke, the words of the instructions wasn't Him speaking, it was the Creator Himself. That's why then the name of the Savior is Yahweh. When he was speaking the holy instructions, he was Yahweh. Any other sentence the Messiah was involved with, as far as himself as a person, he was Yahweh Yeshua. However, he didn't sin. The prime example of these was, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked a few times if there was a chance for him to get away from the situation and there was no reply. But he knew previously he had to go through some of these situations in order for him to become then the very person of salvation. He was then explaining then his human side. He was, obviously, during this time, a person might say in the flesh. However, he didn't sin because he had a divine nature. So then, when we understand the Messiah as then the Creator Himself explaining the instructions, what people reject as instructions, simply they reject the Creator Himself. Many people have the wrong view of the Savior. 
they think as himself as a person who came completed those events and then the instructions were then removed however they were not removed they were completed but then only half of it was completed you have to have the entire or the whole in order for you to understand the completion of the second portion of it so there is no way of rejecting the instructions so then he gave his own son he did not give his son he himself was a completion let's try to understand the point when we think of the Mashiach on stake the Creator Himself was not involved with it. The Creator had then decided of removing His hands from protecting the Mashiach and observing what the world would do with Him. And watch what they did. Human beings, they are beyond scoundrels we have a nature that is extremely destructive we can only understand ourselves when we do understand the instructions so then let's evaluate reading the instructions from Bereshit then to the Ibrahim the more we read the more we detect sin in our lives the more we do these the closer we get to Yahweh and obviously Yahweh Yeshua if we don't do this is similarly you have your backyard then neglected at some point it gets repleted with the junk and then rats they come and then roaches and you name it so explaining the holy instructions is not only hearing what we want we must detect the areas of rejection of the instructions and then forcing ourselves of liking it that's what it means renewing the mind renewing of the mind does not come as a magic potion we have to force ourselves to read so then the Mashiach himself every time he spoke the instructions was not Yahweh Yeshua it was Yahweh the true creator of the heavens and the earth was speaking through him the point is we don't understand the alignment from the creator himself and his wise words through his son because we never heard the Messiah as a person speaking with us so it's not easy understanding the alignment that goes on with it and if we reject the instructions of Moses then truly we are far away from the Creator in a more distant way then the Creator gave his son he did not give his son the analogy is then a person always giving gifts that's the whole scoundrel of the whole situation people they are never satisfied always receiving receiving these and gifts of the spirit and these then the other oh, something else 
Try and understand. The Creator did not give His Son. He simply removed His hands of protection upon His life for a short moment in observing then what the world would do with Him. And certainly the world and its people, the world is scoundrels beyond measure. And then not only this, then the Creator leaves for us making decisions and then what we decide to do. Then the people becomes the temple of the Creator Himself while rejecting His own instructions. The only distinction of ourselves as people in the presence of the Creator is the Creator Himself. We read His instructions and we delight reading it, such as Leviticus and then Exodus, Bereshit, Devarim. We must read until we like it. So, how can we understand of the instructions ourselves when we are living in a world that is so replete with translations and these translations, they don't give the proper understanding. Because the translators did not understand the importance of what Shali Akshavu had said. Renewing the mind. Renewing the mind simply is forcing one's person to read. People, they are always like to hear something new of the instructions. How do they layer those understandings? But do they do then to satisfy another topic so they can talk of it? Or do they understand the Creator never gave His Son? It's true that it was symbolized by then the lambs they used to select every year but the point was not the creator himself placing then himself in a box to give away then to sinful people can be sure of it, the Creator does not love this world whatsoever. Firstly, because love does not exist in the Holy Instructions. You don't find this. Love is abstract. It's not related with the five senses. The Hebraic or the Holy language, it's always related with the five senses of human beings. Love is a word abstract, it doesn't exist. What you find is walking on a path. But people have this understanding of the Mambi Pambi Savior. 
oh he's so loving he you know he doesn't care if you sin or not or So would you give, for instance, your instructions of being, let's say a person who has lots of money, lots of this world's junk, and you have a lot of it, and you had a secret how to make yourself then rich, then you find a group of wretched scoundrels and you walk up to them and say, you know what, you scoundrels, I know how to be rich, to take you out of this poverty. Then you give every secret of your own. Would you be comfortable? Leviticus the 23rd chapter explains a portion of the very structure of the times and the seasons. Then you find the 23rd chapter gives you then Moadim or the holy rehearsals, Mikras, and the nation then trained these feasts every year for more than a thousand years. Can you imagine training these every year after year and a decade and a couple of decades and a century and 500 years and then a thousand years? Then the Messiah came. So then, as we read from the first verse through the 21st verse, you find then the time of the spring or the spring feast. And during the spring, they had certain feasts, and then a section of the year was in the autumn. Then the time of his ministry, half of the instructions, you find then from the first verse through the 21st, and then you find the 22nd is then Ruth, and then the 23rd through the 44th you find in the autumn feast. But then the time of the ministry of the Messiah where half of it was completed was then 490 days. Now if you make the calculation this makes half of the instructions. The other half is the autumn feast. Now, if you understand what it means, then, Yom Kippur. You find, then, a section of this holy feast as, then, the time where every evil spirit goes out of the land. It was like this for many centuries.
490 days. You'll find then these in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. As we read these, then comes the other half, the 490 days of the autumn feast. Where then we find Revelation, we find sections of Yirshiyahu the prophet, and then the feast itself being completed. Truly, the autumn is then a section of the year where then you make the calculation for 190 days is then you find a year of feasts worth of it plus you find until the Yom Kippur where then sin is removed from this world where then the shout of sulfur comes down and destroys this entire planet now reading these we understand that a section of the time where the Messiah spent was then related with more than a year worth of teachings. Now, should we study this further? Absolutely. The calculation was then because of the existing manuscripts points more than a year worth of time because you find then the specific feasts being then observed. Now understandably the year then you find a section and then the other section, both of them combining, you don't find 490 days. You find below 490. But this was the time he spent during his ministry. So the time of the ministry versus then the time of Leviticus as then half of a year or then a section of the year. Those are not comparable. But the point is is not finding then precisely the time he spent with us. The point is he did come and he completed the spring feast. Half of the instructions, half of the prophets. In a span of time of 490 days. This is what we have as records. And we understand at the same time he spent completing the spring feast will be the same time the autumn feast is then. Should we be concerned with the time of a half of the year versus 490 days? We can study, but this won't change the character of the Savior. 
The problem is not the Savior doing 400 or doing half of the year. The fact is we learning how to enjoy the instruction so then we can save our own souls. You won't find a translation 100% precisely every day then to prove you the Messiah was then the true Savior. If we don't exercise reading the instructions as it is without the Messiah and then with the Messiah if we don't enjoy this much are we going to be satisfied when we find then the precise days of his ministry versus then the spring feast? Obviously not. What we do know from the records is 490 days ministry. We do understand that during his time he then completed the spring feast, half of the instructions, half of the prophets. We do understand half of it of the prophets, half of the instructions were completed so as then shall to be then the autumn feast. But then the understanding comes when then we enjoy reading what the Messiah did and then the precise time when the autumn then starts or the autumn feast starts in a portion of the year where then is autumn then you find a year later and then sometime after 490 minus 165 then you find in the very end of this feast is then precisely Yom Kippur. If you make the calculations you will find it. And the point most importantly is we Gentiles are the testifiers on behalf of the Messiah. We won't be there at the end. So what went on in the past, we do understand 490 and in the midst of this time was completed the Spring Feast. This much we know. In the future, the 490 days of the autumn, we won't be there. Gentiles will be far gone. And Greater himself said, and there were some people asking, as far as, as those who were then under the altars for how long this is going to take and the Creator himself said you have to rest for some time yet in other words you have to rest your understanding though they were in a critical situation he's trying to say you have to understand yet this much as the other brothers of yours previously they were then destroyed so then, this time, you and your testifiers are then, the rest of them must be destroyed also, until the numbers are completed. At the end, only the holy cities in Jerusalem, the holy city on Jerusalem, must remain. In the rest of the world is a pure desire for war. And the testifiers are gone. This information might be revolting from some people. But then, these are the instructions. We can't change these. The time of making personal changes regarding the instruction is far gone. It was from 1009 to 2009. Those were the times of deceit. People did whatever they wanted. But those times are gone. 
Let's then read a portion of these revelation regarding the sixth chapter. Then, and when he had opened the fifth seal, he saw under the altars the souls of them, the souls, try to understand, we were going to explain body, soul, and spirit. It's not the spirit, because the path, each person then must discover and walk on it. And then Yohanan saw under the altars, it's plural, the souls of them who were slain on behalf of the word of Elohim and on behalf of the testimony of the Lamb speaking of the Messiah and then a loud voice said for how long we must then endure this and then it was given a bit longer until the numbers are completed So what is then the last understanding of this? We as people understanding the instructions and revealing and testifying on behalf of the Messiah, we won't be there at the end. We must be resting. Surely then, these may sound a bit down when people read it because they always want some sort of excitement. And their desire for excitement is the scoundrelous part of each human being they must deal with it. Firstly, he never gave a gift. Can you imagine if you are a parent, you place your son or your daughter in a box and you wait for thousands of years, then you throw in the midst of scoundrels. What kind of a parent would you be? But then after teaching for more than a thousand years, then you handle your learned son in the midst of scoundrels thinking they will respect this son of mine. Did not Messiah say a parable regarding this? And what did they do with him? So then Later on, we shall to then study more of these relation with the Messiah himself and also his returning and then the conditions of the body, soul and spirit as it was then said many times before and explained for a bit but then we should ponder and then remove from our minds then the word gifting because we have a spoiled scoundrelous nature when we think of gifting is always give and never give back so then please stay tuned much more coming up